So, uh, Pascal's given you the global view of transparency. I'm going to try and give you Josie's view and also a view around the operating context that we're in at the moment. Uh, and I've called this succeeding in an uncertain world. I'm going to cover four areas or four topics. What I call the politics of debt, which I think will tune very much into what Pascal said, and I hope provide fuel for the panels that will follow. Uh, democratic dysfunction, I'll explain that a little further through. Outlook for 2015, and uh, what I believe is the future for IFCs and differentiating qualities. So let's get underway. I've called this slide the age of entitlement too much of a good thing. If you go back to the post-Second World War environment, uh, many developed Western countries introduced uh, uh, social welfare, safety nets and benefits uh, that, that many of us have welcomed and still enjoy today. Uh, but they cost a great deal of money and many of them are still unfunded. And many economists believe that's driven global debt to rather dangerous levels in terms of public finances. Uh, and that fragility really was exposed by the financial crisis. Uh, the consequences of, of which have been a combination of public outrage at those they believe responsible for that, bankers, bankers' bonuses, and tax dodging, in fact, use the vernacular descriptions. Uh, and the, the solution has been to um, take a lot of that debt onto national balance sheets through QE, uh, easing the pain by transferring the debt burden to states. Uh, I think the consequence of that is that we've encouraged even more personal borrowing and potentially asset bubbles through the maintenance of super low sovereign interest rates for a sustained period of time, the like of which I'm not sure we've ever seen before. Um, so what have politicians done in that environment? Well, coming under intense pressure, I believe they've entered into what I call promise inflation. If you look at a number of the elections that have taken place around Europe, people have got elected because they promised a lot. Uh, the, the Greek government is currently grappling with the consequences of that, uh, and it's difficult to see a, a happy ending. Uh, but it's not just uh, the Greek government, it's happening in many of the developed Western economies. So the politician's dilemma, how do you get off the debt carousel? Well, debt's actually easy to acquire, uh, but harder to repay. Uh, I've just taken some measurements here from uh, a, a group of sources, McKinsey, IMF, and uh, Haver Analytics. If you go back to Q4 2000, the uh, global debt position, household, corporate, government, and financial was about $87 trillion. By Q4 2007, just pre-crisis, that had ballooned to $142 trillion. And Q2 2014, seven years into the financial crisis slowdown, $199 trillion. So marching ever onward. So for all the talk of austerity uh, and how difficult life has been, debt has continued to escalate. Um, and I think, as, uh, I think as James Carville once said famously, if he, 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 when he died, he wanted to come back as the bond markets. So the bond markets are, he felt, the most powerful uh, a, a entity in our world. And I think the bond markets will return, ultimately. If governments keep printing paper, eventually the bond markets will stop trusting that paper, and we will be uh, potentially in deep trouble. Uh, this is rather a, a, a sort of tongue-in-cheek way of looking at global debt. This is a pretty serious issue, but uh, this is on the Economist website, if you're interested. It's the debt clock. Uh, and when I did this last, which I think was around last October, uh, it was $54.5 trillion. The reason those figures are smaller, this is just government debt, not the, the total debt position. Uh, I did it again for our funds conference just a few weeks ago, and you can see it's moved up to $55.58 trillion. So, for all this effort and talk about addressing debt, it's actually not coming down, it's going up. I did it again yesterday, uh, and it's now $56 trillion, which is really, I actually found that quite scary. Well, when I did it, I sort of already jumped that much in such a, a, a short period of time, uh, uh, has moved that much in just a few weeks. So, that's driving, I believe, uh, stress in public finances, and that's driving the political interventions that Pascal talked about. This isn't meant to be read, by the way, so don't worry if you can't read it and you think, you're, you think about going to the opticians. Uh, there are 15 promises on here. I've taken these from the um, Conservative Party manifesto, the successful uh, party at the recent election. Uh, uh, and uh, the IFS said of their uh, plan that uh, they've provided a firm commitment to eliminate the entire budget deficit over the course uh, of the parliament. That is the annual fiscal deficit, not, not the debt pile. However, they said they'd not provided anything like complete details of the measures they would implement to bring this about, lacking detail of five billion on tax rises from anti-avoidance measures, 10 billion 
on social security cuts and 30 billion of departmental spending cuts. So that's 45 billion uh, of not too well spelled out measures, which is roughly half the current uh, uh, fiscal deficit. So uh, a lot of promise inflation in there, I think. And now promises have to be funded eventually. Uh, and traditionally, it's been efficiency savings. The balancing item in budgets was will, will, uh, will engender efficiency savings. They don't have to be explained, and they have quite a big number attached to them normally. Um, well, uh, now a crackdown on tax evasion avoidance is challenging that traditional view of efficiency, efficiency savings for the go-to tool of choice for the, the political classes. Uh, and those, those are actually, not, they're not my quotes, they're quotes from the uh, Conservative Party manifesto, the sources of these uh, uh, savings. So, uh, coming nearer to home, to IFCs and places like Jersey, are we going to be the pot of gold that will solve the fiscal gap? Well, this would indicate that we're actually, in fact, we're not. Um, if I'm converting now to sterling figures, almost one and a half trillion national debt in the United Kingdom, I think the budget's now pushing up towards 700 billion per annum. Fiscal deficit, I think it's probably about 80 now, it was about 97.5 when I did these figures. HMRC's own estimates of tax evasion, tax avoidance, maximum collection opportunity from all sources, about 7 billion, and from offshore sources, about 500 million, which barely registers uh, on that graph. So we are not uh, going to be, um, if you like, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow because it isn't actually there. Uh, but it isn't just the United Kingdom. Uh, most countries, uh, most developed countries have these problems. Germany has these problems. The, the, the US is the big daddy with nearly 15 trillion of uh, debt, 15 trillion dollars. Uh, China has them increasingly. Uh, and uh, if Mr. Putin didn't think he had them, he will very soon if he carries on as he is. Um, so this is driving international action, uh, uh, some of which Pascal touched upon, but we've seen the focus on large corporate profits, we've seen the focus on the, uh, the wealthy, we saw the most recent uh, example being the HSBC leaks, the Swiss leaks issue, uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. Hodge uh, hauling uh, bankers uh, before for yet another public flagellation, uh, 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 and then we saw the early adopters group in Berlin uh, just a few months back. So the international agenda is marching forward on this quite strongly. And for the reasons I've outlined, I don't think that's going to change. Uh, I think many people in the room might have felt a little sigh of relief at the election outcome here in the United Kingdom where you've got a more business-orientated party uh, that can kind of express its values uh, more freely. Uh, but I think what I've shown you in terms of public finances means that uh, the focus on the wealthy, the focus on financial services, and the focus on our kind of centres is not going to diminish. So, with that kind of pressure and backdrop, uh, how do you deal with that kind of situation? And I'd like to explain to you how Jersey has been and proposes to deal with it. Uh, it's a quotation here from Socrates, the way to gain a good reputation is to, be, is to endeavour to be what you desire to appear. And that is be real, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. If you think about who forms the judgments about whether you are up with the program or not, whether you are a cooperative member of the global community, whether you are somebody that's contributing or detracting, uh, these are the fora that will provide the information on which the political classes will make their judgments. They are the Financial Stability Board, and through them the IMF, the triumvirate of the IMF, the OECD, and the World Bank. Uh, and it's critical about your compliance standards with these organizations. Uh, and at the last IMF review we had published, uh, we achieved the highest compliance scores ever achieved by any single country uh, to that point. So our stated aim is to meet or exceed international standards, whatever the program. Uh, but we, at the same time, we do, uh, as Pascal referenced and as Colin Powell, I think, has been feeding into these four for many years, that is on the basis that there should be equity and a level playing field, that we all operate to the same rules. Uh, this is our transparency journey, if you like, and uh, much of the focus of today is about transparency. In uh, the late 90s, we introduced uh, legislation that made tax evasion a, a crime, a criminal activity in Jersey, uh, and then began underpinning that with a range of measures to dissuade bad business and to dissuade non-disclosed business. Uh, so we've engaged with all of these programs over time, Harful Tax, USD, the TIA program, uh, the US FATCA, which is really the game changer, UKIGA, the European Initiative, CRS BEPS, and now the great debate over central registers. Uh, uh, and we continue to contribute to those debates and seek to influence them wherever we can, whilst being 
uh, uh, compliant uh, in terms of confidentiality. But we decided that wasn't enough. Um, it, it, it actually, in terms of the political dialogue and the media commentary and the kind of view of the guy in the street, it wasn't enough to say you're compliant, cooperative, and you do things the right way, despite having a considerable evidence book to that effect. You also have to, I think, demonstrate you're making a worthwhile contribution to society. Uh, so we set about uh, proving how we do that. We always had that conviction and belief, but our evidence book was a bit thin. Uh, so we commissioned uh, a couple of years back uh, a study by Capital Economics on our relationship, our economic relation to, to Britain, which uncovered that we support 180,000 jobs in the British economy through the activity and economic value created by the international capital we bring to Britain. It generates about 9 billion of GDP uh, and provides 500 billion of Britain's foreign direct investment. That's 5% of the entire stocks of foreign capital in the British economy. Uh, we moved on to try and explain more clearly how money moves around the world and how efficient capital allocation is important to take the friction off the passage of capital so it can be hubbed and spoked, taken from where it's not working, put to work, create jobs and growth, and wealth through the process. That's essentially what we do as an international finance center. And finally, uh, we've looked at Africa more recently and identified a significant investment shortfall that we believe we can help plug of around $11 trillion. What has been the impact of that uh, collective action? Well, I, I think it was very heavily, uh, uh, very significantly responsible for David Cameron's pronouncement in the British Parliament that our kind of center, and Jersey in particular, should not be described as a tax haven, uh, and that our contribution to the financial system should be recognized, and our standards should be recognized. More recently, uh, Pierre Muscovici, who's the EU tax commissioner, former French finance minister, said uh, just last week, Jersey is an important partner against tax evasion and fraud. So the work we put in, the, the long, hard yards of uh, not only committing to international standards, but putting the infrastructure in place to deliver them, and the value we create for the jobs and growth agenda is getting through to the important policy influences. I'm gonna move on now and look at the outlook, uh, uh, perhaps look at things a little more commercially, having looked at the political uh, uh, and the transparency agenda and the general backdrop. Uh, I think a collective view of a number of economists, and I hope to hear more uh, uh, later, so we have two economists here today speaking to us, uh, is that we're going to see growth uh, in 2015 and growth in 2016. These ranges are getting a little bit dated now, 28 to 3.8%. If you get more GDP, you get more trade. If you get more trade, you get more wealth. If you get more wealth, you need more wealth management. Uh, so this is good news for the private client community. There are much stronger drivers, though, than short-term market cycles, and it's important to lift our heads periodically and not get too bound up uh, in today's news about financial services. Uh, I put three of them on here. Um, I think McKinsey would argue you should put urbanization on there as well, but uh, globalization, population, and digital. Globalization has pulled hundreds of millions of people from poverty through trade over the last 30 years and been far more successful than any aid intervention. Uh, population will drive a greater consumer classes. That will drive entrepreneurialism. That will drive wealth creation and increased demand for your services. Uh, and an estimated growth from around 7 billion to 9 billion uh, people on the planet by 2046. And both of those trends will be supercharged by the digital economy. Everything will go faster, happen faster, uh, 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 and really accelerate the process. So what is that actually doing to the wealthy? Well, I, I've taken this data from the Capgemini Merrill Lynch study, uh, which is uh, these days, I think, sponsored and supported by RBC Wealth Management. Uh, and wealth was up 14% in 2014 in the high net worth category. Uh, high net worth, it's not just value though, and stock markets and asset values rising. The numbers of high net worths expanded by 2 million to 15 million globally. Uh, and there were changes in their behavior the propensity to haul assets out of your home country, that is do cross-border investment, is growing. Uh, in 2013, it was 25%. In 2014, it was 36%. It had gone up 11 percentage points. There's a greater allocation to alternates. Uh, there's a greater interest in social impact investing. So as well as investing my money, is it doing any good? Uh, and direct contact, although still highly valued, the face-to-face -face client service from the private client community, still highly valued, 
Digital demand is growing, which has implications for the way we deliver service to private clients. Uh, just as an aside, Jersey, uh, as well as being a, a large private client center, is also a major alternate center. In the last five years, our private equity footprint's grown 62% and our real estate footprint around 50%. So well placed to provide the supply of product uh, for that growing need in the private client uh, community. I would lay the claim to be the world's leading trust jurisdiction. We should debate this one day and, and, and have a for and against, but I'll stand on a stage anywhere in the world and debate that. This is the world's leading trust jurisdiction. Uh, the trust law's only been amended six times in 30 years because it's a really good law. Uh, and uh, that has driven 400 billion of investment value settled into Jersey Trust by individuals, families, um, and corporates. Uh, a recent innovation now powering on the Jersey Foundation, 282 foundations now driving up towards 300, one third of which have been established for philanthropic or charitable purposes. But we're not standing still. I've said it's only been amended six times, but amendment number seven is coming, so we do scan the market, we do listen to the advisory community, we do listen to what clients need and want, and these are some of the matters that are under consideration. Uh, when you go to network uh, breaks, uh, uh, find a guy called Bill Byrne, he's our technical director, and he will tell you chapter and verse about these, so if you're really, really interested in legal development and the sort of front edge uh, pioneering developments, he's your man. Beneficiaries' rights to information, the ambit of trustee indemnity provisions, ability of courts to vary trusts, concern to trustees and beneficiaries, merits of enforced arbitration and privacy issues surrounding hostile court actions, all actively on the agenda and are likely to feature in trust amendment number seven. Uh, the backdrop I've given you, I think, is affecting uh, the relativity of different international finance centers. A number of international finance centers around the world are shrinking, uh, under duress, under pressure, we're actually growing. Uh, we put on 400 new jobs in Jersey last year, so despite what you might read in the press, uh, we're growing and actually in a pretty strong shape. These brands have either moved global operations to Jersey in 2014 or grown their existing footprint. And I've just shown them as a random selection who are involved in all sorts of different sectors and businesses. Uh, and we're driving up now towards 13,000 employees, uh, the largest workforce of the British CDs or overseas territories. I'm going to conclude by uh, stating my thesis that IFCs have a great future, but I'm going to caveat that statement only if they are politically and fiscally stable, that they have sound public finances and a stable political environment, that they have the breadth and depth in cross-border expertise to provide global client services, that they're transparent and positively committed to the international standards agenda, that they're soundly regulated with strong legal systems, uh, and that their proposition is built on protecting and enhancing wealth, not based on secrecy. And they will need to demonstrate they're contributing to the jobs and growth agenda that benefits their large near neighbors. I hope you'll agree with that conclusion in terms of Jersey ticking each one of those boxes, and you will keep it on your choice list for placing your client business. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.